Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. I am very excited to be attending and participating in the Institute for Functional Medicine's 2017 annual international conference this year, The Dynamic Brain, Revealing the Potential of Neuroplasticity to Reverse Neurodegeneration. Uh, this presentation is meant to be both an introduction as well as to be somewhat foundational as it relates to the topics we're going to cover uh, at the upcoming conference. So, let's get started. We're going to explore how it is that a functional medicine approach may well offer up so many new possibilities in terms of dealing with so many of these chronic diseases that are so challenging to us knowing that functional medicine really allows us to consider the notion of prevention and even reversing uh, some of our most dreaded conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, actually considering the, the notion that we can prevent and even reverse these conditions, uh, that's going to be a central theme throughout this uh, presentation, throughout the conference. Treatments uh, target the support and restoration of optimal physiological function. In other words, allowing the, the discussion, finally, of recovery from uh, issues like those listed below. So the, the, the advantage here is that we're going to be looking at a, a, a systems approach to, uh, that will ultimately illuminate key details about how a patient's unique journey from health to disease has evolved and how it continues to evolve what is it that set the stage for this individual to manifest uh, a particular neurological problem? What is keeping that uh, situation ongoing and perpetuating the, the whole uh, downward spiral? So first we consider the antecedents. What are those issues that uniquely define that individual? What uh, events have occurred earlier in that person's life? Uh, what sorts of genetic predisposition might an individual have? What sorts of single nuclear polymorphisms does this individual harbor uh, that may set the stage uh, for further events later in life, like triggering events that may occur that will play upon the antecedents and ultimately be perpetuated, uh, mediate and, and perpetuate uh, the downward spiral, the increase production of free radicals, the inflammatory mediators, compromise of energy, the increased um, signaling that leads to apoptosis, dropout of brain cells, uh, ultimately leading to loss of structural integrity and ultimately functional decline. So obviously as part of the functional medicine matrix, we consider assimilation. How do we assimilate uh, nutrients, for example, into the body uh, that function uh, not only as uh, macronutrients, for example, but function as uh, information uh, to instruct our, our genome, that function as uh, fuel sources to nurture, for example, the uh, gut bacteria and allow the gut bacteria then to express their genetic complement and produce various metabolites, short-chain fatty acids, neurotransmitters, etc. And in this conversation of assimilation, we should look at how we bring other things into our bodies, even uh, certainly paying attention to the air that we breathe. Now, the notion that uh, the air that we breathe may have a role to play in terms of the health and disease resistance of the brain, I think is relatively new information. Uh, this is a recent report uh, from Science Magazine, January 27th, 2017. Interesting study looked at uh, particles smaller than uh, 2.5 uh, micrometers. Uh, they are called PM 2.5. We know that these are among the most toxic size of particles uh, in, as it relates to uh, humans. And interestingly, they are the least regulated. Uh, ingestion of these uh, particles is associated with higher levels of oxidative stress. And uh, we know that exposure to these particles is associated with asthma, lung cancer, and coronary artery disease. So we, we see a relationship there uh, between uh, the uh, exposure to these uh, particles, these PM 2.5s, and inflammation. We know that uh, there is a relationship 
between exposure by virtue of living near, uh, for example, a busy street uh, and risk for dementia. A recent Lancet report, as described in this Science Magazine article, demonstrated that there is uh, a, a tenfold increased risk of dementia in looking at people living within 50 meters of a major roadway in comparison to those who live at least 150 meters away. Uh, and this was a study done in Ontario, Canada, uh, evaluating more than 6.6 .6 million subjects. We understand that ingestion, breathing uh, of particles uh, induces inflammation directly in the brain as these particles may be absorbed through the olfactory bulb and uh, the cribriform uh, plate that pollutants can certainly uh, irritate the uh, nasal epithelium and increase the production of brain uh, uh, sensitive uh, cytokines and certainly cytokine uh, is upregulated cytokines in the lung when the lung is exposed to these part, uh, particulates. So we know uh, further uh, from Harvard research that looking at the Framingham data, the exposure to these particles uh, these PM 2.5s uh, is associated on uh, uh, volumetric studies of the brain with a smaller brain volume. So while it's certainly important to look at the food that we eat, what other things might we be ingesting uh, that are also amping up inflammation and now uh, being demonstrated to be correlated uh, with uh, smaller brain volume? Uh, here's what some of the research looks like, at least in uh, rodents clearly demonstrating that when you expose laboratory animals to uh, a polluted atmosphere, especially uh, one that contains higher levels of these uh, PM uh, 2.5s, that we do see increased cytokine production, increased oxidative stress, and even uh, increased production of uh, intracerebral plaque formation, uh, which is certainly seen uh, to be uh, a major area of research as it relates to uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we need to consider the air we breathe certainly as a triggering event, uh, and it is certainly a triggering event that we can uh, make choices about. Recognizing that the air that we breathe may well be related to increased inflammation, increased oxidative stress, and even protein misfolding within the brain. So certainly a modifiable factor. The next very important uh, subject that's going to be looked at in the um, symposium is neurogenesis. And uh, I certainly have to admit that it's only been quite recently that we've been able to embrace this notion uh, that the growth of new brain cells is something that occurs uh, throughout uh, our lives. It occurs into adulthood, in fact, throughout our lives. As mentioned, uh, this is relatively new information being published in the journal Nature Medicine just recently. That's November of 1998. Uh, Dr. Peter Erickson, uh, working with Dr. Fred Gage at the uh, Salk Institute in California, was able to demonstrate that neurogenesis was occurring in humans and specifically in the uh, granule cell layer of the dentate uh, gyrus of the hippocampus in humans, demonstrating staining using bromodeoxyuridine, uh, a thymidine analog, which labels, uh, labels cells during their uh, replication, cells which are replicating, stain with BRDU. Uh, and this was demonstrated in a series of humans who had uh, passed away uh, from another uh, from a form of cancer, these individuals were exposed to BRDU because it was a way that they were able to follow their cancer. Again, BRDU labels uh, cells in mitosis and uh, Dr. Um, Erickson and Dr. Gage took advantage of this to uh, re realize and to discover that this activity was happening in humans. They demonstrated that a cell genesis occurs in human brains and that the human brain retains this potential for self-renewal throughout life. This is a, a, a huge fundamental for us. Uh, we all obviously want to know what it is that we can do to enhance neurogenesis within our brains. And it turns out that neurogenesis is highly dependent on something called brain 
derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF. And as a matter of fact, when you look at a recent study uh, that was uh, published in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association a specialty journal called uh, JAMA Neurology back in uh, January 2014, researchers uh, leveraging Framingham Heart uh, data looked at over 2,000 individuals who were 60 years or greater and, greater and did not have dementia. They followed these individuals for a 10-year period of time and measured their BDNF at the baseline of the study. And what they discovered was really quite interesting, that those individuals who had the lowest level of BDNF, and that's the top curve here, had the highest cumulative incidence of dementia. An easier way of looking at the data, I think, is uh, by breaking it down by quartiles. And the scale on the left is dementia risk over 10 years. Again, those individuals on the far right who have the highest level of BDNF at the beginning of this study uh, had the uh, lowest risk for dementia. Well, let's take a, a closer look at this BDNF and actually why don't we insert BDNF into the functional medicine matrix and ask ourselves, what does BDNF do? Well, uh, we know that BDNF uh, is certainly involved in the maintenance of structural integrity of our neurons. Higher levels of BDNF are associated with reduced um, outcome, uh, severity of outcome in individuals, for example, who uh, experience head trauma also uh, involved in defense then of our neurons and even in repair of neurons. And so these are the factors in exercise and movement as well as nutrition that we can look at and leverage uh, in an attempt to raise BDNF because BDF is so fundamentally important for structural integrity, for defense and repair, and certainly important for the notion of enhancing the growth of new brain cells, which is neurogenesis, and even the connection of brain cells, a process called neuroplasticity. Now, we're going to hear quite a bit from Dr. John Rady about the importance of exercise. And again, recognize exercise is a very, very powerful way of basically turning on uh, the production of BDNF and is clearly associated uh, with uh, the increased growth of, of brain cells. This study published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease in March of 2016 uh, by researchers at UCLA, uh, Dr. Kirk Erickson's group uh, looked at 876 subjects. Uh, we'd say these are elderly subjects and looked at uh, their cognitive assessment. Were they normal? Did they have mild cognitive impairment? or Alzheimer's disease, and also measured the volume of their brain using volumetric MR brain imaging, and also asked questions about their weekly energy output. In other words, how active were these uh, individuals? And what they found was really quite interesting, that caloric expenditure had a significant effect upon gray matter. And these are some of the areas of the brain uh, where there was strong correlation uh, with caloric expenditure in terms of increased amounts of, uh, and certainly preservation of gray matter. And their conclusion was that studies such as this one suggest that simple caloric expenditure, regardless of the type or duration of exercise, may alone moderate neurodegeneration and even increase gray matter volume in structures of the brain that are central to cognitive function. And this uh, certainly plays on previous a research that demonstrates both increased levels of BDNF along with increased size of the hippocampus and uh, enhanced cognitive function uh, in individuals who are engaged in activity. So this process of growing new neurons and even the functionality of uh, neurons and how neurons connect to each other, uh, the process of neuroplasticity is really one of the central topics that we're going to be looking at uh, at the um, annual international conference of the Institute for Functional Medicine again uh, in June of uh, this year, 2017. Some real uh, all-stars going to be uh, speaking to us. Uh, Dr. Michael Merzenich certainly is one. 
Dr. Merzenich uh, is, <laughs> been, has been called uh, the father of this uh, whole idea of neuroplasticity. Uh, his uh, presentation is The Science of Brain Plasticity, Research, Application, and Future Direction. We know that research is now very strongly supportive of the idea uh, that we can systematically harness this process of neuroplasticity and drive adaptive changes in dysfunctional neural systems through carefully designed mental stimulation. And that's what he's going to talk to us about, these um, cognitively challenging activities that can be specifically directed uh, to drive these adaptive changes in uh, circuits that may be dysfunctional. Brain training like this exercises the brain to improve aspects of cognition, including things like memory, attention, focus, and even brain speed. Patients who have already established mild cognitive impairment have shown significant improvement in overall cognition using uh, this type of uh, training that Dr. Merzenich is going to explain. Further, these cognitive uh, training approaches have broad potential as part of rehabilitation therapy for individuals who have had uh, strokes, for example, uh, also in the area of treating neuropsychiatric disorders and other conditions as well. Uh, Dr. Merzenich is considered to be, as I mentioned, the father of neuroplasticity research. He will trace his research showing that neuroplasticity remains through adulthood, just like neurogenesis, and, can, um, and he will discuss uh, what the future looks like in terms of how the brain can be retrained. Dr. Merzenich has a terrific quote that I often use in my uh, presentations, experience coupled with attention, and I'll explain that uh, later on, leads to physical changes in future functioning of the nervous system moment by moment we choose and sculpt our ever-changing minds. We choose who we will be in the next moment in a very real sense. And these choices are left embossed in physical form on our material cells. So it's experience, it's repetition, but it's also paying attention to those experiences, giving attention to the things that we are doing that will lead to physical changes and uh, future functioning in the brain. Now, uh, in addition, uh, we are going to have the uh, great opportunity to heal, hear from Dr. Dale Bredesen. Dr. Bredesen is going to be presenting uh, his research dealing with how we uh, actually rewire the damaged brain. Uh, I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with uh, Dr. Bredesen's uh, incredibly groundbreaking research that was uh, published in the journal Aging. Uh, in the fall of 2014, in which he actually demonstrated reversal of Alzheimer's disease in nine out of ten uh, of his original patients. Brain degeneration, like dementia, is complex. It's not uh, an event that is repaired by taking one magic bullet. Uh, Dr. Bredesen will again uh, describe uh, his research. You know, when we realize that one in 10 persons over 65 and nearly half of those over age 85 here in America have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, uh, this research becomes very, very impactful. We know that billions of dollars are spent on research and we're spending about $230 billion annually just caring uh, for Alzheimer's patients here in America. Yet, Therapeutic improvement has been marginal and uh, unsustained. We've really not seen the development of an Alzheimer's drug uh, that has any meaningful benefit. The past few decades of genetic and biochemical research have revealed an extensive uh, network of interactions at the molecular level that are involved in Alzheimer's pathogenesis. And this suggests to us that we need a network-based therapeutic approach rather than looking at a single magic bullet. As Dr. Bredesen says, we need a magic buckshot. Uh, we know that uh, taking this approach, looking at leveraging uh, multiple uh, uh, ideas, as in Dr. Bredesen's approach using 36 different modalities, uh, that this may potentially be much more effective as a treatment, indeed, as he has demonstrated. Based on the hypothesis that Alzheimer's results from an, an imbalance in an extensive plasticity network, 
and that therapy should address as many of the network uh, components as possible, Dr. Bredesen has really taken the lead in this systems-based personalized therapeutic approach to Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative condition. He is going to discuss uh, his human trials that have shown, uh, as I mentioned earlier, significant improvement in cognitive function and a reduction in various Alzheimer's disease-related symptoms. Dr. Bredesen is going to emphasize that it is complexity that is the culprit uh, in Alzheimer's disease and that there are dozens of biological mechanisms that underlying that are underlying the dysfunction and hundreds of potential in, uh, interventions that may change over time. Again, emphasizing that this requires a systems approach that is personalized. These factors that he's going to talk to us about and their complex interrelationships, again, have to be personalized based on each individual's specific defects and obviously what their needs are. Dr. Bredesen will detail the work he's done to begin to, des to design this personalized program and to address the active and underlying pathways in Alzheimer's and further uh, the notion that there are various Alzheimer's disease subtypes uh, that he has uh, revealed. Another speaker that I am very much looking forward to hearing is Dr. Rudolf Tanzi. Uh, Dr. Tanzi's uh, discussion is going to be entitled Genetics, Lifestyle, Alzheimer's Disease, and Neuroinflammation. And uh, we're going to get to uh, the notion of neuroinflammation in a little, uh, a little bit later in this uh, online presentation, really recognizing that inflammation is the cornerstone of our most dreaded pernicious uh, neurodegenerative conditions. Dr. Uh, Tansy is going to reveal that recent uh, genetic research uh, has clearly identified uh, a set of single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs uh, that are associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So taking us you know a, a lot further than simply looking at the APOE profile. Uh, he describes a model that is emerging showing that Alzheimer's risk is reduced by processes that suppress inflammatory cytokine signaling and enhance the clearance of debris, including the clearance of amyloid. Dr. Tanzi is one of the foremost experts in Alzheimer's disease, and he's going to explore the interplay of genetic susceptibility factors, these predisposing factors that interact then with environmental issues and lifestyle factors over which we have control. And these are things like sleep, diet, uh, how much exercise we get, intellectual stimulation, and social engagement. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And how looking at these factors and leveraging these factors uh, that we can actually have a powerful positive impact in terms of reducing neuroinflammation. He will then review the emerging and potentially uh, exciting uh, new therapies in prevention and treatment. Again, Dr. Tanzi uh, uh, is going to focus on this notion of the brain on fire, how uh, inflammation really represents uh, one of the pillars uh, mechanistically of uh, so many of our dreaded neurological conditions and frankly uh, we could add uh, cancer, uh, diabetes, coronary artery disease, and so many other chronic degenerative conditions to this list. We're also going to be exploring how the microbiome, how this collection of organisms living within us, also play upon this mechanism of inflammation, which again is seemingly upregulated in uh, such a, an, uh, a powerful list of brain-related disorders. So we will look at this functional medicine uh, matrix and recognize that we can intervene uh, at multiple areas uh, that can then ultimately lead to uh, an increase in our ability to defend our neurons uh, and therefore lead to structural integrity and uh, look at mitochondrial therapeutics, increasing energy uh, availability through the work uh, that will be presented by Dr. Terry Walls. Uh, biotransformation and elimination of things like toxins. Dr. Joe Pizzorno is going to be talking to us about that as well. But 
Getting back to the notion of inflammation, I think it's really relevant and timely to understand how our loss in microbial diversity or reduction of microbial diversity, uh, diversity uh, for example, by our exposure to various issues like antibiotics, other medications, uh, glyphosate that is sprayed upon foods that are genetically uh, modified, ultimately leads to uh, increased gut perme permeability and it is this increase in gut permeability that is really central uh, to the uh, uh, production of inflammation within the body. Uh, this recent study from the Journal of Molecular Genetics and Medicine looks at uh, how gut dysbiosis promotes inflammation in the brain, like Dr. Tanzi is going to be talking to us about neuroinflammation, how it relates to vulnerability uh, to Alzheimer's disease, and actually explores some uh, therapeutic uh, implications related to this whole notion of the gut, and specifically dysbiosis, or uh, issues related to loss of species diversity in the gut, and how that relates to things like uh, gut inflammation, permeability of the gut, uh, this translocation of lipopolysaccharide, we'll talk about that in just a moment, how that increases the production systemically of pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, leading to inflammation relating to the brain, and how interesting it is that one of the most widely used medicines to reduce inflammation, uh, these non-steroidals may actually enhance this entire process and actually fan the flames of inflammation. Well, let's take a, a moment and look at gut inflammation and ask how can we relate inflammation of the gut back to the topic of the day. The idea that our brains uh, grow new brain cells and you know the structural integrity and functionality of the hippocampus. Well, what an incredible uh, study uh, by Dr. Uh, Svetlana Zonis uh, that is entitled Chronic Intestinal Inflammation Alters Hippocampal Neurogenesis, published in the Journal of Neuroinflammation in 2015, calling our attention to the fact that, yes, neurogenesis in the hippocampus is certainly involved in learning memory, uh, but also keep in mind that we depend upon neurogenesis for control of our mood that we see decreased neurogenesis and decreased levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor uh, that correlate to depression. Decreased hippocampal neurogenesis elicits significant behavioral changes in addition uh, to cognitive changes. And what these researchers did was they took uh, laboratory rodents and put dextran sodium sulfate in their drinking uh, water. Dextran sodium sulfate powerfully induces inflammation in the gut. And they demonstrated this by showing uh, increased inflammatory cells uh, in the gut, uh, in the, both the colon and the cecum, uh, in the guts of these laboratory uh, animals uh, 29 days after they had been treated with dextran sodium sulfate. The animals developed inflammation of the intestine, which led to a progressive weight loss. We see a loss of weight in humans, certainly with inflammatory bowel disease. But more importantly, systemic tumor necrosis factor alpha, an inflammatory cytokine that has been found to be elevated in patients with Alzheimer's disease, I might add, was dramatically elevated in these animals in whom gut inflammation had been induced. So a systemic event of inflammation induced by creating inflammation in the gut. The animals uh, were sacrificed and in looking at their hippocampus, uh, comparing the control to the dextran sodium sulfate or the gut inflammation, we see a substantial reduction in uh, these uh, pink staining uh, new, uh, neurons. These are actually new neurons, this is neurogenesis. In looking at the hippocampus, of the laboratory animals after they had received uh, dextran sodium sulfate. In other words, gut inflammation was induced, and here we see a dramatic reduction in the growth of new brain cells. Staining for KI67 is a marker for uh, neurogenesis being uh, seen here to be reduced again in those laboratory animals that had been treated with an agent that led to um, inflammation within the gut. 
So their uh, results indicated that intestinal inflammation suppresses hippocampal neurogenesis. That is a very, very powerful statement. Uh, we know that uh, we see significant mood disorders, for example, in, and cognitive impairment in individuals with full-blown inflammatory bowel disease. But what about those uh, individuals who have lesser degrees of gut inflammation that may be induced uh, by other uh, issues that lead to increased gut permeability and therefore uh, increased inflammation? Well, having just said that, let's just first take a step back and look at the gut epithelium and gain an understanding as to how inflammation is induced by changes in the gut epithelium. The epithelium, or the epithelial cells are held together by uh, tight junctions and we absorb things uh, through uh, the gut epithelium both transcellularly, in other words through the cells, uh, by uh, facilitated channels and we also absorb paracellularly uh, between the tight junctions. This is how we absorb, uh, how we assimilate, uh, getting back to the functional medicine matrix, those things which our bodies require. However, in the presence of stress and infection, of various drugs like uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, like I mentioned earlier, proton pump inhibitors, xenobiotics or uh, toxins in our environment, Dr. Prezorno is going to talk about that, gliadin and even glycated proteins, AGEs, we get breakdown of our uh, tight junctions leading to increased permeability. And perhaps one of the biggest issues with reference to increased permeability is the presence of lipopolysaccharide transgressing from within the gut, uh, getting through the uh, epithelium, and then actually challenging uh, our immune cells, including macrophages and T cells, and then causing these immune cells uh, to increase their production of inflammatory uh, mediators, cytokines, leading to inflammation. So again, LPS, which is uh, certainly measurable in the laboratory, uh, either LPS in and of itself or LPS uh, antibodies, uh, LPS recognize that is actually uh, also known as endotoxin. It's on the cell membranes of the uh, gram-negative organisms that live within the gut. When LPS makes its way uh, through this now somewhat increased permeable uh, epithelial lining, that amplifies the production of inflammation, uh, uh, rather the inflammatory cytokines. So we can measure IgM and IgA directed against LPS as a marker of uh, LPS uh, transgressing the epithelium. And we see, for example, that in major depressive disorder, there's a dramatic increased uh, level of these antibodies against uh, IgM, uh, rather against LPS, both IgM and IgA antibodies, uh, indicating two things. A, that the gut has become permeable, and B, uh, that inflammation has been uh, amplified. We see elevation of plasma LPS, in sporadic amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And with disease progression, we continue to see correlation of the level of plasma lipopolysaccharide. Uh, we see LPS elevation in Alzheimer's disease, and we even uh, see LPS dramatic uh, elevation, also known as uh, endotoxin, correlating with autism in, uh, co in uh, comparison to controls. And again, this LPS is a, a systemic IgM-mediated response against, uh, against, again, LPS, and it's an indication of what we call uh, leaky gut. So the measurement of LPS is a way of uh, assessing the gut for its permeability and is, an, uh, is also a marker of inflammation to some degree. So we really depend then on the integrity of the uh, gut lining uh, as it relates to balancing immunity and regulating uh, inflammation within our bodies, the integrity of the gut lining compromised by so many factors I've listed, but also the maintenance of that integrity uh, is the job of, the, uh, of a healthy diversity of gut organisms. So uh, as we move forward then, we recognize that so many of our challenging uh, neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, 
affecting uh, 5.6 million Americans, no effective treatment, no cure. Autism, again, no treatment, no cure. Depression, that's affecting tens of millions and certainly a significant cause of mortality. And even ADHD, more than 6.4 million Americans now, American children being treated, two thirds of them being treated with drugs. We may be looking in the wrong place. It's really time that we focus on what is going on in the gut, recognizing that maintenance of the gut epithelium is paramount in terms of getting back to regulating inflammation. Uh, we see studies now like uh, Dr. Amali Fox's report. Uh, I had a wonderful interview with her recently. Uh, she looked at the uh, degree of uh, variability of diversity of gut bacteria by measuring parasitic stress in various countries around the world and plotted them out. Higher levels of parasitic stress and higher levels of gut diversity uh, to the right and to the left lower levels. Let me make this uh, simpler. But she also looked at uh, prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in the very same countries. Let's simplify a bit. Again, uh, here we see higher levels of microbial diversity, increasing parasitic stress uh, in these countries, uh, less microbial diversity and less parasitic stress in countries like America, Iceland, Denmark, etc. When we look at the uh, Alzheimer's uh, prevalence uh, plot, it's actually very simple. We can superimpose these and see that on both plots, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Angola are uh, localized in the areas of increasing um, gut diversity of organisms with much lower prevalence of Alzheimer's as opposed to countries like where we live, uh, where we have lower diversity of gut organisms and certainly higher levels of uh, uh, prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, suggesting that variations in hygiene may partly explain global patterns in Alzheimer's disease rates that microorganism exposure may actually be a very good thing for us and it may be inversely related to Alzheimer's disease risk. So this notion that various unknown factors then lead to activation of the brain's micro, uh, microglial cells which produce inflammatory cytokines which ultimately enhance oxidative stress, we really should start to challenge this uh, idea that these are unknown factors. I've already shown you that, for example, just uh, breathing uh, polluted air uh, is associated with increased production of inflammatory cytokines. And I believe throughout the conference, we're going to explore what these unknown factors are. Uh, for example, uh, you know, not getting enough exercise, eating certain foods that change the microbial diversity, uh, foods that directly increase inflammation. We're going to be able to jump on this, um, this process uh, in multiple areas. And what is uh, really exciting about Dr. Bredesen's work is that he targets multiple areas on this continuum to bring about improvement in brain function leading to reduction in brain dysfunction. So we have this notion again that these are unknown factors and I think we're starting to understand that in fact many of these uh, factors are well known and that they culminate in uh, mitochondrial dysfunction which then triggers uh, the pre-programmed uh, cell death from neurons. These unknown factors that we will explore that are actually well known now uh, lead to mitochondrial DNA mutations, uh, depletion uh, uh, in the mitochondrial DNA, which ultimately leads to uh, problems with how mitochondria work, a dysfunction of the electron transport chain, the ETC, and that increases the production of free radicals. This creates a perpetuating feed-forward cycle because these free radicals that are increased further damage the mitochondrial DNA. Now, the reason this becomes uh, an issue for us is because it leads to this activation of cytochrome C. Transmembrane activation then happens to lead in the cytosol uh, the, within the cell. This gets out of, uh, from within the mitochondria into the actual cytosol itself, uh, leading to activation of what are called caspase enzymes, and that triggers the cell to undergo apoptosis or neuronal death. So this connects then 
these unknown factors that we're going to explore ultimately with neuronal death. Now, as we again uh, focus on uh, our antecedents, those things that pave the way, again, these are, are many issues that uh, to some degree we don't have control over, like our genetic predispositions, but we're going to be assessing uh, how uh, various uh, antecedents uh, might be involved in, for example, our uh, uh, biotransformation and elimination. How exposure previously to toxins, for example, might lead to difficulties or problems with energy production, and how energy production, uh, as I've just demonstrated, mitochondrial dysfunction, ultimately leads to uh, apoptosis or neuronal death. Obviously, that's going to uh, fall into the category of loss of structural integrity. And having said that, what can we do then uh, to enhance and preserve uh, energy production and ultimately lead to defense and even repair, uh, regeneration, if you will, of neuronal of, of neurons and therefore neuronal function and cognitive function. We now recognize that we live in an age of, of what is called mitochondrial medicine and recognize that our most worrisome uh, neurodegenerative conditions are really looked upon as represent, representing acquired mitochondropathies. And what this study way back in 2009 uh, was calling upon was the development of new drugs uh, for existing targets that could enhance aerobic metabolism that could enhance the way mitochondrial work and even the uh, the growth, the biogenesis of mitochondria, uh, mitochondria themselves, enhancing the growth of mitochondria because we know that throughout the, the panorama of neurodegenerative conditions that changes in mitochondria, uh, these perturbations in mitochondria are protein and that it's reasonable to consider that many of these neurodegenerative conditions really are acquired mitochondropathies. Uh, we, we know that thus far mitochondrial medicine has kind of failed us uh, to in the, the goal of revolutionizing the treatment of neurodegenerative conditions, but we still have a long way to go. And uh, what this uh, study calls our attention to is, this paper rather, that it's worth noting that two non-pharmacological interventions that benefit human health, which are dietary restriction and exercise, work because they increase mitochondrial respiration. So while we don't have yet drugs uh, to treat these so-called neurodegenerative mitochondropathies, we do know that there are lifestyle players in the arena of functional medicine, dietary restriction and exercise that are clearly related to the increase in mitochondrial functionality. Uh, we depend upon our mitochondria to power our brain. Uh, this uh, activity going on between and within neurons is very, very dependent upon mitochondrial function and you know, at rest, while the human brain is only 5% of our body weight, it's consuming 25% of our caloric burn. So again, our dependence upon the functionality of mitochondria is, is really quite evident as it relates to brain, the brain in terms of its day-to-day -day function, and certainly now a powerful target uh, that as we look upon the mitochondria and enhancing mitochondrial function, uh, as a target uh, for neurodegenerative conditions. In fact, uh, this is what researchers are looking at, energetics in the pathogenesis of neurodegenerative disease. Uh, this is uh, a review uh, in uh, Trends in Neuroscience. It's written by uh, one of the most highly regarded uh, individuals in this whole field of uh, mitochondria as it relates to the brain, Dr. M. Flint Beale, uh, author of this a really powerful book, Mitochondria and Free Radicals in the Neurodegenerative Conditions. So again, let's look at the functional medicine matrix and let's just focus uh, for a moment on assimilation. What are we bringing in uh, to our bodies that may in fact enhance uh, energy production uh, and therefore have a role to play in preserving and enhancing 
mitochondrial function? Well, we just looked at uh, dietary restriction, caloric restriction, and uh, physical exercise as well, but it's now become clear uh, that when we enhance uh, energy production and viability and functionality of mitochondria, it goes a long way towards de defense and repair of our neurons and ultimately structural integrity as well. We are now seeing interventional trials geared at enhancing mitochondrial function in the neurodegenerative condition. Uh, conditions. For example, this uh, relatively new study, June of two, 2016, looking at giving N-acetylcysteine uh, to support dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's disease, a preliminary both clinical as well as uh, uh, in uh, vitro uh, evaluation. What these researchers did uh, in both an in, in vitro and in vivo study, uh, they uh, looked at human embryonic stem cells uh, that were derived from uh, midbrain dopamine neurons. That's where the uh, neurons are uh, that are involved in uh, producing a dopamine uh, in the substantia nigra, the pars compacta of the substantia nigra. This is where these dopaminergic neurons live that then project to areas like the basal ganglia. Uh, it is these dopaminergic neurons that are compromised and degenerate in Parkinson's disease. Well, what these researchers did was they treated uh, these dopaminergic neurons uh, with rotenone. Rotenone is a, an, uh, is a uh, powerful uh, herbicide and it's known, an insecticide, and it's known to uh, actually inhibit complex one of electron transport chain, uh, which happens to be the exact place uh, where the defect is thought to exist in the electron transport system in uh, Parkinson's disease. So they were able to create basically Parkinson's-like brain cells. Uh, and again, uh, they then uh, treated both the cells uh, with NAC, but they also gave NAC to humans suffering from Parkinson's disease. And then they performed DAT scan studies. Now DAT scans actually measure dopamine transport in the brains of Parkinson's patients. They also evaluated these patients with the UPDRS, which is the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, uh, to measure their clinical symptoms. Again, recognizing that Parkinson's disease is a disease of oxidative stress. We know that in Parkinson's there is increased oxidative stress, lipids are oxidized, uh, DNA is oxidized as measured by 8-hydroxydeoxyguanine, uh, guanine. Uh, that glutathione, one of the brain's most important uh, antioxidants, is dramatically uh, depleted in Parkinson's disease, and the magnitude of the depletion of glutathione parallels disease severity. You might think it might be a reasonable idea to give glutathione to Parkinson's patients based just upon that. Uh, who knew? Uh, but so why would then NAC be a choice? NAC uh, protects the mitochondrial electron transport chain uh, and is therefore involved in reducing neuronal apoptosis. Recall earlier when I demonstrated that when mitochondria are compromised, then uh, through uh, cytochrome, cytochrome C and then activation of caspase enzymes, neuronal apoptosis happens. We can reduce neuronal apoptosis if we can preserve mitochondrial electron transport function. NAC does that. It also reduces inflammation by reducing NF uh, kappa B, and it also is noted to reduce um, abnormal protein uh, folding, and as we know, NAC enhances glutathione availability. So let's first look at the in vitro study, looking at what are called TH positive neurons. These are neurons that are positive for tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the enzyme involved in producing dopamine. So in looking at these tyrosine hydroxylase positive neurons, uh, this is the control. These are the tyrosine hydroxylase positive neuron count in the uh, cells that have been treated with rotenone. Uh, rotenone, as mentioned, is a powerful mitochondrial toxin. But when treated with 15 nanomolar rotenone plus NAC, look at the preservation 
in tyrosine hydroxylase, meaning better dopamine availability. Here's an even more powerful dosage of rotenone, uh, and then uh, salvaging these neurons uh, with NAC. What I think is even more compelling is to look at pre and post uh, NAC, giving NAC to humans and performing DAT scans and looking at the dopamine transporter binding in their basal ganglia. These are Parkinson's patients. Look at the dramatic increase uh, in binding of the dopamine transporter in patients having received NAC. Again, this is uh, mitochondrial therapeutics. This is targeting mitochondrial function by giving NAC to enhance mitochondrial function, enhance uh, glutathione availability, reduce uh, inflammation, and reduce pro abnormal protein folding. When we look at the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, in other words, the higher you are uh, on the scale, the more functional you are, the more motor functionality you have, uh, uh, as demonstrated by this very standardized scale. We see that post-NAC, there's been a dramatic improvement uh, in these individuals by targeting their mitochondrial function. Again, this study recently published just uh, in June of 2016. So uh, finally, uh, I, I want to just focus on two other issues. First, stress. And I think that we'll uh, certainly hear from Dr. John Rady uh, about stress. Stress being uh, certainly related to uh, degeneration of the brain as was so uh, eloquently described way back in 1992 by Dr. Robert Sapolsky uh, in uh, his work looking at primates who were stressed and uh, others who've done research demonstrating uh, in looking at uh, a control monkey versus a monkey that was stressed. Again, looking at the hippocampus, we see a significant uh, dropout. This is the control monkey. These are um, neurons in the hippocampus, neurons dropping out uh, in the stressed uh, monkey. Uh, so we know this is uh, something that may well be happening in humans and being certainly validated by more current research. Uh, this report was uh, just published uh, here in 2017, January 2017, a study that looks at long-term cortisol measurement, actually measurement of 24-hour urinary cortisol, uh, four times or, or so uh, during a 10-year period, 10.5 years, uh, looking at uh, 1,661 non-demented individuals, average age around 60 years. Again, measuring 24-hour free cortisol levels, and at the same time measuring crea uh, creatinine, rather creatine levels. Uh, actually, it should be creatinine. Uh, and just using creatinine because it uh, standardized the uh, cortisol measurement. Looking not just at the uh, cortisol, free cortisol to creatinine ratio in the urine, but also the variability of that level. And First, we look at the level of the urine, uh, urinary free cortisol to creatinine level in uh, controls versus uh, patients who would go on to develop Alzheimer's. We see that those individuals with the higher levels of uh, urinary free cortisol had a significant increased risk of developing um, Alzheimer's disease. And in looking at uh, the variability of uh, cortisol, also correlating uh, with risk for development of Alzheimer's disease. So it means not just chronically under, undergoing stress or experiencing stress, uh, but in addition, those individuals who have stress that occurs from time to time because the hippocampus plays such an important role in regulating our corticosteroids via a negative feedback uh, loop that was actually defined by Dr. Sapolsky. Uh, it is possible that cortisol production may contribute to Alzheimer's pathology and in turn be influenced by the development of Alzheimer's, meaning that as the hippocampus degenerates, it, uh, the hippocampus acts as a, as a uh, suprahypothalamic break, meaning the hippocampus influences the hypothalamus's ability to regulate cortisol. As the hippocampus is damaged in Alzheimer's, more cortisol is produced which further damages the hippocampus. This is what we call a feed-forward uh, cycle. The uh, researchers indicate that 
uh, looking at cortisol uh, may very well be a preclinical marker of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, finally, uh, as we look at the functional medicine uh, matrix, I think several of our uh, participants are going to, uh, func uh, going to discuss the, the important role of uh, social aspects of our lives and the important role, for example, in terms of this interrelationship between our emotional state of mind, our mental state of mind, and even our spiritual state of mind as influenced uh, by the various uh, relationships that we have, that having relationships with others and socializing is actually uh, a powerful medicine, uh, indeed, as it relates to the brain, uh, a very important part of the functional medicine matrix. So, this is a, going to be a very, very uh, exciting uh, experience for all of us in June. So I think you'll agree this is going to be an exciting conference, power-packed with uh, amazing information, amazing presenters. Looking forward to seeing everybody there. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter.